We have now the final session of this day, and uh, we will speak about biowet in the light of global warming and biodiversity loss. Quite serious matters. We will now have um, a session with um, Borga Omos. Are you with us, Borga? Um, there you are. Could I please have a very short introduction of you? And you can correct me after. Borga Omos is a senior researcher at CICERO, an important center for climate research. In addition, he has contributed to the United Nations panel on climate change. Is this almost correct? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I could say much more, but this is a serious matter. So we are very much looking forward to what you will say to us. Borga, the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you. So I will try to share my screen here. Let's see. And then I will try to start my presentation. Let's see. Yeah. Yes, and you're seeing my, the front page now. Here, let's see. Same problem. Uh, could you the same problem? Yeah, could you make it a little bit bigger, please? The wrong screen, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so the display settings uh, swap, right? Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah. Let's see. Yes. Lovely. We did it. Thank you. Yeah, so it's nice. I can see my own presentation. Um, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I will talk about uh, climate change um, in Norway and Europe, and also uh, the impacts on ecosystems. And I will also present some material from the most recent IPCC reports. So I was uh, contributing to uh, author to the last one in 2013, and then uh, a number of my colleagues have uh, contributed to the, in this one. Um, uh, so uh, climate change is just one of many issues impacting nature. So I'm just presenting this um, one of these headlines figures from the IPBS, which is kind of a sister organization to IPCC. Uh, and then I hope you're seeing my mouse. It should be okay. Um, so and th this part of the figure showing what drivers are impacting the terrestrial, so on land, um, species of land, freshwater and marine. Uh, so there's all these uh, land use uh, impacts. So, so uh, concerning land, we're building infrastructures, cities, crop, uh, croplands, pasture, pl we have a plant for it, so it's less than 30% remaining uh, of the ice-free land. And then there's the, the direct exploitation of uh, animals and so on. And then it's this red red bars here, that's uh, climate change. And as uh, uh, climate change progresses and becomes more important, this, this part will um, increase. Uh, pollution is next, uh, invasive uh, alien species and others. But uh, the, re the remaining part of my talk will be on this part, on the climate change. Uh, first, the big pictures, uh, big picture. So uh, I will, for most of my talk, I will talk about what's happened the last 200 years and the next 100 year. But we should, why is climate a problem? Um, or why are we talking about it so much? So looking at, this is the global temperature the last 20,000 years and um, uh, during the ice age here. Uh, so in the green line here, and uh, most of uh, Scandinavia was covered in ice, something like two kilometers of ice, uh, four degrees colder than today. Uh, and then I have this uh, increase in temperature and then this period, this is a very important period in the history of mankind. So we um, we invented civilizations, uh, we began producing a, a lot of crops. And, uh, and one of the main reasons is that the climate here was very stable. And we, we are adapted to this kind, in this climate. And then something happens around that time. So it's, uh, we're, we're starting to uh, dig out oil, gas, and coal from the ground and burn it. Um, and then the temperature shoots up quickly. <clears throat> 
so normally we're just looking at temperature the last 200 years and then it looks very smoothly like this it's just a slow increase but actually it's it's happening very quickly and um going forward if we if we are not doing anything then the temperature will really skyrocket to three four maybe five degrees global warming um something similar to the ice age uh, the opposite way but the critical part here is this is happening so quickly so nature cannot adapt we, we humans will also have huge problems we will have problems producing enough food for everybody on the planet if we but i will mostly focus on uh, animals and so on nature and this is just happening too quickly and here are the targets so the paris agreement that we should stay below two or preferably 1.5 degrees so it's it's still a big jump but if we can stay here consequences are more moderate uh, and so the um, yeah, the next part of my presentation is on the the latest ipc ipcc report from uh, which was launched launched uh, about a month ago. Um, this is the front page of that. Um, I will just give some headlines. So it's we, we, we're observing the um, increase in global surface temperature. It's not not just something we predict betwixt for the future, but we we are seeing it. It, it is happening, and it's happening very fast. So for the last at least two thousand years, it's at the highest, the highest speed. Uh, looking at the numbers, so here is um, the, temp the global temperature um, to last few thousand years. And it's often called the hockey stick curve because it looks like a hockey stick. So uh, it's really rather flat and then this um, uh, part of the stick. And so this is the observed. Um, um, the same figure here, so the black line here is what's observed since 1850. And then we can run different climate models. So we have this um, uh, bluish kind of, uh, if you're only looking at natural um, um, natural uh, causes, then it, it doesn't match. If we include all we emit of uh, CO2, of methane, of uh, natural uh, laughing gas and other uh, greenhouse gases and so on then there's a big good match so so we can model this and we observe uh, we observe this and then we we observe changes in the climate system in all parts And in previous uh, reports from the IPCC, often the, the, there's been numbers like there's 90% or 95% likely that it's human-made. Now it's it doesn't really carry, um, it's more like a fact. So we uh, get rid of this percentage. So we're just saying it's human-influenced. It's widespread, it's happening quickly. We can see it in the atmosphere, in the ocean, snow and ice, chrysler, and also in the biosphere. Um, so, for instance, in the CO, uh, CO2 concentration, so increasing rapidly, and then this is also important for ecosystems, so like everything that's uh, connected to the photosynthesis. Uh, precipitation, um, so looking at the upper part, so northern hemisphere temperate land, so that's typically um, yeah, southern part of Europe. So, so the brownish is kind of dry and then getting more and more wet so into the blue. So it's getting wetter. Um, uh, glacier mass loss is also getting more and more blue. So it's more and more loss. Uh, temperature, which I all already shown, it's getting warmer. Uh, global sea level rise, going, uh, it's happening. It's going faster and faster. And maybe even, maybe the most important part, because ocean is very important for climate. It's This is where most of the heat is stored. And the ocean is also warming and it's happening. Uh, it's picking up. Uh, then th this figure is a bit complicated. Um, so it's on uh, extreme episodes. Um, so the 
top part here is on heat waves, hot extremes, on heavy precipitation, nedbør på norsk, and then on drought, uh, and uh, specifically uh, related to agriculture and ecosystems. Um, and then I hope most of you can see it's really a map of the world. So we have the Americas, Europe, Africa, Asia, Australia. So similar to the map on the left side. And for those living in Norway, then this upper upper part here, Northern Europe, and then those from Spain, Portugal, then it's this Mediterranean box here. Um, and no surprise, as it gets warmer, then the um, hot extremes are also getting warmer. So this is seen basically everywhere in the world. Um, yeah, heavy precipitation. So th this is maybe uh, what's impacting Norway the most. So the extreme precipitation is becoming more extreme, both the intensity and the frequency. And the more extreme, the more the bigger the change. Uh, so this is what we see in Norway. So it's green, so it's an increase. But for the Mediterranean, it's we don't see that big change. Uh, so um, yeah. So so that's the difference within Europe. Uh, and then to the drought. Uh, so one thing is the precipitation. Um, here in Norway, it will rain more, maybe. Maybe not so much in summer uh, in Southern Europe, then it's, it, it will rain less during the summer season. And uh, also important when it's uh, becoming warmer, then um, yeah, the, the, the land will dry out faster. So it's the uh, evaporation is going faster. And so the combination of those two things is really causing a problem in Southern Europe. So the, the Mediterranean here is uh, uh, in yellow here. So it's an in increase in this droughts. Uh, and uh, these extremes are, are of course, uh, important for the species living uh, the ecosystems because it's often the coldest day during the summer or the most important, the warmest um, warmest day of the year, the, the, those are um, can make or break whether um, an animal or a plant can live um, in, in a given place. Yeah, so the changes are uh, happening uh, most quickly in the Arctic. So uh, in terms of temperature, it might, as three times faster than the global average during winter. And uh, more of the precipitation will come as rain. And yes, so the Arctic is really changing, e even though we're... Um, even though we're making it to two or one point five degrees, the Arctic will be completely different. And in a uh, world where it becomes four or five degrees warmer, then the Arctic will be completely, completely different. So the ecosystems will change. <clears throat> As a climate researcher, it's very easy to talk about the future, what's happening in 2100, but now it's um, yeah, easier and easier to show examples of what's happening today, like just following the news uh, this summer um, um, the, and the extreme rain and flooded, uh, flooded events in uh, Europe this summer. Central Europe, uh, very good examples. Uh, sea, sea level rise, this is something impacting us. And it's uh, during the storm surges, uh, the, the ocean is at the highest. So we're experiences, uh, we experience higher uh, storm surges. Yeah, uh, I, I already mentioned uh, the extreme rain. So um, the, it's um, especially here in the Northern Europe, we see more more of this. And this is uh, uh, the most costly damage to, uh, here in Norway, uh, causing flooding. And it's a particular problem in uh, populated areas. Um, so looking, uh, going back to nature, so what, um, how will this impact uh, nature in Norway? So there's this report we wrote uh, three years ago. So um, here in Norway, it's it's the mountains and the regions in the north, the polar regions that are impacted the most. Uh, 
Um, so among the reasons are that, that the plants, as they move upwards in the mountain, at, at some given point, they cannot uh, go further up because there's the mountain stops. There's no higher uh, and no higher point to go to, and the same going northward. Suddenly you're in. Um, uh, you can and then then you have to start to swim, um, and also as with more rain and more rain, uh, more of, um, uh, rain floods and so on. Um, nature uh, near uh, sea lakes, yeah, streams, rivers are also impacted. <clears throat> this this figure is in uh, mostly in Norwegian, so I'm sorry about that. But maybe that's easier for those uh, Norwegian in the crowd. Um, so so the important uh, here is to show what types so natur type in uh, Norwegian. So what habitats or biotype types are mostly impacted of um, in Norway in terms of climate change, and then going from yellow to red, where it's mo most most impacted. So it's uh, to the left here, open landscape, mountains, forests, and then um, yeah, coastline, beaches, um, wetlands, and fresh water. Um, so it's typically everything related to water uh, often. So it's this uh, open fl floodplain um, along the coast. Of course, when the sea level is rising, then the dunes and the wash margin um, and, and similar uh, fresh water, so streams and rivers. And in and, and, um, wetlands, then it's this um, pulsa, so it's kind of... Um, uh, peat, so it's uh, in the line between the permafrost in the north, where uh, the ground is frozen, and further south, where we don't have permafrost, is this uh, pulsa type uh, feature, uh, which will disappear completely from uh, um, from Norway. So I will shortly end. So the last the last point uh, I will uh, be I will give here is on the uh, from the one point five uh, report. Um, so what surprised uh, researchers the most was uh, how big the difference is between 1.5 degree and 2 degrees global warming. Uh, it's just half a de degree, but it's actually uh, quite a big difference. So in terms of nature, uh, going from 1.5 to 2, then we double uh, the number of species being threatened by climate change. And we double the area um, that will experience a major major change in ecosystem. Um, there will be a much bigger decline in fish stocks um, and also food production. So it's more um, human-made nature, but also decline in food production. And then the list could go on the water shortage uh, and so on. Uh, thank you. Any quick questions? Well, it was an impressive speech you had now and uh, quite serious, but there is hope also. Yeah, no questions. You were good, Boga, you were good. Yeah. Okay, thank you. But can you say something optimistic? What, what should we do so we can smile when we leave this room? Yeah, so I focused on all the dramatic um, and not the solutions. Um, so, so when when I'm working on climate, then it's it's very often easy to present all the negative. But when I'm working on climate change, I see there's so much happening these days. Uh, for instance, in uh, financial and uh, private industry. So, like the last year or two that happened more than in the last 20 years. Um, I could present emission trends and in the previous, yeah, some years ago, it really followed the um, more like worst case, but it's the worst case isn't, seems less and less likely. So uh, emissions are, <laughs> are going, are, are better than uh, we could expect. Uh, but still, there's a lot of work to do. Um, the main solution is, of course, um, transforming, going from fossil fuels to um, all this um, so water and um, the wind and solar and so on, all the renewable energy. And this, this is like in Europe, this is happening now and it's happening uh, 
past. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. We continue this day with um, Norwegian wetlands and uh, Nils Harley Boysen. Are you here? You are senior advisor in Sabima. You have your background as ecologist and nature manager, now a specialist on water management. Could we say that? Yeah, please. The stage is yours. Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, yes. Thank you uh, for inviting Sabima to uh, to speak to everybody. Uh, you know, in the the, the uh, scope of the last two slides uh, and the biodiversity crisis and everything I can uh, and what I do with conservation, uh, I can certainly say I've had worse days on the job. So it's quite a pleasure and. Uh, privilege to come and speak to everyone. Um, I'm going to uh, try and quickly get through a uh, presentation about uh, biodiversity degradation and the importance of nature with local in parentheses with regards to Norway's freshwater habitat. Um, I'm Nils Harley Boyson. I'm one of two freshwater uh, conservation coordinators I'm standing in front of my own presentation here. Um, uh, my close colleague, Osa Renman, we both uh, technically, uh, yeah, we represent over one million memberships across uh, seven organizations. Uh, we are technically hosted by Sabima, but uh, have the other organization as our uh, employers. Um, many of these organizations are themselves also umbrella organizations for other smaller groups. Uh, Sabima has eight organizations. Uh, which are mainly the biological organizations like uh, ornithologists, the ornithologists, uh, and the entomologists, and the botanists, and a lot of the amateur, uh, passionate uh, people that like to go out and uh, document observations out in nature and a number of other things. I can also mention that Sabima is uh, part of the cooperation for the visitor center, for the uh, wetland visitor center in Oslo, uh, which is one of the five. Uh, um, yeah, uh, official w wetland centers. I don't really know how this works or not, but uh, I'll steer clear of uh, stepping into that. Briefly about myself, uh, ecologist, natural resource management uh, degree from a uh, university here in Norway. I grew up in the States, but I've been in Norway the past uh, 20 years. Did my uh, master's thesis actually on uh, yeah, natural resource valuation by uh, people in Tanzania's biggest inland wetland relative to fluctuations in food security. After that, I went to, uh, on to work for an indigenous watershed conservation organization in Alaska. And uh, up until April this year, I've been working in WWF as an Arctic advisor. Uh, and also I live on a river just north of a delta. So I have, I would say, a, a personal and a professional interest in uh, this with uh, freshwater conservation. Uh, I also want to mention real quick, Sabima has been doing a lot of work, extensive work uh, in the last number of years to save wetlands in Norway. Uh, the last couple of years through the campaign, uh, Save the Bog, uh, the most important goals have to do with um, uh, banning basically cultivation and draining of bogs uh, and uh, more protection and more restoration of uh, bogs in Norway, wetlands in general. Uh, jumping over that. So, Freshwater habitat in uh, Norway, a little bit about the status of the environmental goals and the indicators. In Norway, there are 24 environmental goals across the, across the board, and these are uh, assessed through 83 indicators. For uh, freshwater and wetland areas, uh, it's mainly two goals and four indicators that are relevant for the discussion. Uh, there's something called the nature index that's used to help us assess uh, goal achievement, and it's a value from zero to one with one representing ecosystems being more or less as they would be if uninfluenced by uh, human development. Uh, but if you actually look at the benchmarks and a number of the ways they're assessing this with regards to unaffected by humans, you could maybe question uh, how these are actually being uh, measured. But uh, I'm going to be presenting a little bit of how the authorities uh, kind of are portraying uh, the situation in Norway and, of course, working in conservation through ideal organizations. Uh, there's, a, I would say there's a slightly more uh, cynical view of how things are looking, but uh, uh, we like to think that our, our assessments are uh, 
slightly more uh, of a, uh, <laughs> I would say, a, a truthful uh, portrayal of the facts, uh, at least from the conservation perspective. In any case, uh, all uh, lakes and rivers in uh, Norway should have good ecological condition. This is uh, basically the main goal in uh, Norway's water regulations, which also reflect uh, how Norway is implementing the EU water directive. Um, if uh, measures are not uh, put in place, however, about 74% of Norwegian rivers and 78% of lakes will not achieve this goal. Uh, between the 50s and the 90s, uh, quite a lot of freshwater nature in Norway was highly degraded due to acid rain uh, uh, regulation of watersheds, hydropower development, uh, agricultural runoff and uh, sewage runoff from settlements and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but since the 90s, quite a lot of measures have been put in place and there's been a lot of improvements. Um, so there are about 55 species uh, associated with the rivers and lakes in Norway that are considered critically endangered or endangered. About 196 uh, are vulnerable or near threatened. Uh, there are also six endangered habitat types uh, associated with rivers and lakes. Um, basically, one of the biggest uh, influences uh, are, is actually hydropower development, uh, which is about a third of the watershed area in Norway, which is quite highly influenced negatively from that. So it uh, puts a, a slight... Uh, uh, other a different perspective on this whole uh, sustainable power production uh, thinking in Norway, which I'm not going to get into uh, here. Um, yes, and over to uh, wetlands, uh, yeah, uh, swamps, bogs, marshes, and that sort. Um, it's the conditions are good uh, in much of the country, uh, but uh, since the fifties, quite a lot of the original area has been highly degraded, um, and many are lost. And uh, so you could say that for many of the remaining, it's good, but the total situation, considering what has been degraded and what there is plans for continuing to degrade, is is. Yeah, uh, not very good. So there's two different ways of looking at this. Um, the main issue is changes in land use that has uh, degraded most of uh, the existing, uh, uh, or not most, uh, one third of the wetland area uh, during the period of about the, the 50s to the 90s and up to now, between the 90s and now, it's been a, a slight, uh, what do you call it? negative trend, but uh, in the past 10 years also, it's kind of flattened out. Uh, so like I said, whoops, that's in Norwegian. Uh, a third of the, the bogs are gone. This is actually twice uh, the global uh, backdrop of 15% um, here in Norway. And as I said, it has uh, basically mostly to do with uh, land use changes. They've been uh, drained, dried out, cultivated. Uh, for agriculture and forestry mostly, and otherwise these are very interesting areas for other uses, so, yeah. Um, with regards to endangered species, 14% of uh, the endangered species in Norway are actually associated with wetlands and freshwater areas. 85% of these are uh, um, threatened by land use change. So uh, I know BioWet is looking uh, quite a lot at uh, climate change, which does play a role also in association with the other threats. But with regards to uh, freshwater habitat in Norway uh, and especially wetlands, it, it really is land use change that uh, we need to be having a, a big focus on. Uh, there are also 19 endangered habitat types uh, within uh, sort of the category of wetland areas. Um, yeah. And uh, despite uh, how this looks, uh, the authorities are saying that the, the official status is medium. So it's, uh, it's a little hard to see how it, it wouldn't be considered worse uh, if you were to ask uh, the conservation organizations, to be honest. With you. But this brings us to a quick uh, uh, overview of uh, Norway's ecosystem-based management. Here we have the, uh, what's it called in English, the white-throated dipper. And this is Norway's national bird. It's dependent on uh, fresh, clean, running water, uh, whitewater areas. And kind of like the uh, white-throated dipper, Norway's environmental management is also uh, a national pride. Uh, but 
while maybe thriving, is facing quite a lot of challenges. We have uh, a number of uh, fundamental principles in ecosystem-based management, the precautionary principle and regard for cumulative impact, uh, both things that Norway is very poor at. Um, in Norwegian, the precautionary principle is called Fødevård Principe, but uh, we like to call it Ettersnod Principe. Only the Norwegians will understand what I mean by that. Um, cumulative impact and precautionary principle are also very um, dependent on one thing, and that's that we have knowledge about nature and, and all the ways that decisions are being made. They must be based on facts, and uh, that's really not the case in Norway. Uh, exacerbating this is that municipalities are delegated quite a lot of the decision-making responsibility and uh, to an even less degree than the uh, regional states, the uh, what's that in? The, the region, the big counties and uh, also uh, within national terms, uh, the, the municipalities, uh, they just don't have the funding to have the expertise and the knowledge uh, to, to really gather all the important information they need to make these decisions. And especially with regards to uh, oh, an entire watershed, it can be a conglomerate of quite a number of municipalities all making different decisions, which affects cumulative impact uh, in a sense. And then, of course, we have uh, restoration, which is an important part. And like uh, our environmental minister, uh, Ruth Walton, said earlier, he was speaking very warmly about us entering now the decade of restoration. Uh, but if you look at uh, how much the government is uh, going to fund, at least right now, uh, all the restoration work needed, it's probably going to be the century of restoration, actually. Quite seriously, actually. Um, so a quick uh, look at uh, cumulative impact, sort of how this kind of looks in Norway for a watershed. Uh, I didn't know this term in English, actually. Many a little makes a mickle. Apparently, this is sort of a, a Scot Scottish word for a lot. Uh, it's a more of a relevant phrase in Norwegian. Many small uh, creeks make a big river. And that's an interesting way of thinking about cumulative impact. So you, as we go through this, just imagine that there's a bunch of different municipalities making all these decisions independent of one another, even though technically we are now implementing uh, watershed management plans that are supposed to be holistic, but I would say they're still struggling with uh, regards to this. Up in the top, we have our uh, regulation of water through different means, but mainly hydropower development. Uh, we also have uh, huge areas uh, disappearing to, uh, I would say, neighborhoods of uh, recreational cottage developments. Uh, lower down, we're draining the, or have drained or are draining uh, or continue to drain uh, areas that technically are wetlands. Uh, we're building our roads uh, far too close to lakes and rivers and reinforcing them without regards to habitat. Can canalizing, channeling uh, many of the rivers in the lower areas to get the floodwaters fast and out of there, which is uh, very devastating for the habitat in them. Uh, a lot of runoff and uh, putting uh, smaller creeks in uh, yeah, highly channelized areas and even pipes. And then, of course, uh, where people live, they want to live as close to water as possible. I'm one of those people, actually. Um, and uh, in the end, especially in Delta areas, it's just a huge mess of interests all overlapping in uh, areas where basically where the land meets the water and people are involved. Um, and I propose Delta is one of the uh, threatened uh, nature habitat types in uh, Norway with regards to water. It's technically on uh, listed as vulnerable. You'll probably recognize that this is the Delta area we're now in front of. I couldn't get a, an area picture from before 68, unfortunately. So I understand that the, the delta originally before the water rose, it probably looked way cooler if you have your biologist uh, uh, glasses on. Um, but it looks, at least from since 68, there's uh, from the macro, not, not a huge difference. But uh, as we were told when we were eating lunch, uh, 50 years from now, we might be able to walk uh, dry-footed out here due to all the uh, sedimentation and uh, yeah, the regrowing of the area. Um, yeah, so there are about 290 river deltas that are bigger than 250 uh, decars. Uh, of these, um, 66 are probably more or less functioning as uh, yeah, highly functional ecosystems. However, 45 of them are not ecologically functioning, 40 of which are in the southern bulk of Norway, also south of Trondheim, uh, more or less. And there's quite a lot of 
smaller river delta areas, among them the one I live close to, uh, that are not very well documented and categorized, and we just don't know um, their condition very well. But these are also very important areas. Um, wow, that was not working out very well on the... Yeah, uh, in, the, in the water management system, you can uh, uh, go online and you can look at the different, uh, uh, as we say, the, the many different creeks that make the big rivers and look at their individual uh, ecological status. Uh, on this, it would be green is uh, great, uh, blue is okay, uh, yellow is not so good, orange is bad, and red is really bad. And uh, this is, by the way, the... Uh, uh, watershed area for the delta here. Uh, the rivers running into the delta, this would be Etna. And uh, flowing up here, we also see that most of the area is pretty good, except for the main river. And then up here, we've got two really bad rivers. And the reason for that is just uh, yeah, back to cumulative uh, impact. Up here, we've got hydropower uh, regulations that's basically destroyed the habitat for fish and other aquatic life. Uh, down here, the uh, conditions for fish are pretty bad for different reasons, among them uh, pollution and uh, uh, land use changes and uh, hydropower influences. Um, and I also want to say a little bit quickly about citizen science. In Norway, we've got a great system for this, uh, which uh, is the species database, uh, where amateurs and uh, experts as well, but a lot of amateurs. Amateur, the original meaning happens to have to do with passion, amore. So these are passionate people going out and they register their observations online. And you can look uh, at areas that over time, maybe they indicate that this is something we need to look at more closely. So this informs. Um, uh, management quite well, uh, though I would say there are a number of industries in Norway that are not too happy about this, uh, to be honest. But uh, this is all the endangered species in the Delta area uh, across all the uh, categories. Critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable, regionally extinct. And you can also uh, document alien species. These are the ones with severely high risk for the area. So that's uh, very interesting for informing management. Um, Finally, I just want to talk real quick about the value of nature. I don't need to explain to this group uh, what ecosystem services are um, or why they're important. Uh, we do know that there are a lot of ecosystem services that are very difficult to measure in economic terms, but still there are quite a lot that are possible to measure in economic terms that we do not. And when we are not including uh, more specific measurements of how ecosystem services benefit us uh, in our impact assessments and in our decision making, at least in Norway, nature is almost always the loser. There was a, an assessment in 2013 for ecosystem services in Norway that more or less concluded that it's way too cheap to consume Norway, uh, to, consume, uh, eco to consume nature in Norway with regards to ecosystem services, and that uh, 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 yeah, uh, the, the value of ecosystem services just has to be far more visible. And so working in conservation, I am here standing in front of you and in the job I do, I, I, I'm doing it because we're actually in a biodiversity crisis globally. Uh, and we're in that biodiversity crisis globally because there seems to be a very strong disparity between how we value nature and the actual value that nature has for our existence. Uh, so I'm going to round off with regards to ecosystem services with talking a little bit about the qualitative uh, evaluation. Um, I happen to think that the most underestimated uh, prerequisite for society to want to care for nature has to do with its citizens actually genuinely valuing nature, which again requires that people actually experience nature as personally meaningful. And today, when we're living in this uh, uh, crisis of uh, nature and, and climate, I'm thinking that with regard to how important nature is for our actual existence, you could say that nature's role as an arena for meaningful experiences, in particular, 
the local nature where people live and work is in fact maybe nature's most important ecosystem service so that people will have a closer association with nature and want to take care of it. So thank you. Thank you very much, indeed. <clears throat> thank you. We're coming closely to the end. We had two short sessions. Now it will be bird migration patterns with Jan-Erik Röhr from Lista Bird Observatory. Please. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, this one. So uh, I would do a speech about uh, bird migration in southern Norway, uh, changes and variation and patterns of migration f for 32 years. Um, this is done um, at Jomfrulan and Lista Bird Observatories. It's uh, coastal migration sites in southern Norway. Um, these sites are typical for bird observatories with important migration routes, large habitat variation, protected areas, high bird species, diversity, large numbers of birds, and good migration overview. Um, so where is this? We have Lista to the very south of Norway and Jomfrulan at the southeast coast. Birds are passing here uh, along the coast. Uh, these 32 years of bird migration monitoring uh, has focus on common Norwegian breeding and migratory birds like this robin. Uh, we have done uh, bird ringing which is standardized but uh, because this talk is about uh, some of the biovet indicator species, uh, they are not uh, caught in nets, they are uh, seen in the field. So then uh, we have the focus on our field observations, uh, which uh, are done, there are migration and resting counts, and then they are not standardized as the ringing. Uh, still, uh, we have daily counts from sunrise, at the same site on both, occasion, both uh, localities, uh, about 200 days every year in spring and autumn. Um, this is of course uh, observer sensitive, um, but it's a large material with 6,360 days. That was in the end of 2020, so now there's more. Um, and we have about 22 million birds in our database. So even if uh, not uh, standardized, um, the large material will like even the most of the counts. This is how it goes. Looking at the birds, some gray -like geese pausing. There's cool guys here and they're not reacting on anything, just counting. Was a <laughs> falcon going there. So climate change, springs comes earlier. And uh, the question is how the migrant birds adapt. Short distance migrants, um, they can feel uh, warmer winds sitting in, does this work? No, yeah, the pointer. Sitting here in the Netherlands and Britain, they can feel the warmer winds arrive and then uh, migrate up to Scandinavia, like the starling. Uh, that appears early in spring. Um, go with the flow in a way. Uh, for the long distance migrants, it's uh, very different. Uh, so they have been like more, we have been more concerned about those because they are, they, if you are a swallow down in Pretoria in uh, February, you can't just look at the weather forecast to see how you're going to do this 10,000 kilometers journey. It's a really long, and you should be here at the exact moment. So it's a, yeah, they have to be pre-programmed in a, in a way. 
um, and rely on their inner sense of time. Um, so they go up, and uh, typically a wood warbler is like a pairing from the woods of Congo to Norwegian woods in spring. Uh, so the, the question about these long distance migrants, uh, if they have eno enough time plasticity in, in this pre-programmed they have. They, they leave from Africa at some certain time and they should be in the north. When the climate very goes changes, so how, how will that work for them? Um, can they change their time schedule enough? Uh, people are very concerned about this. This is something, if you work with birds, uh, journalists and news are very interested in. How do they manage now when the climate changes? So what uh, if you arrive a little late? Uh, is it a real problem? Uh, there are so many things like uh, influencing on this journey and uh, in the breeding areas, in the winter rearing, so it, it's quite hard to pick that this is doing exactly, this is a problem. Uh, you see the cuckoo, um, so it's an example, um, and some other examples. The cuckoo, they go from Africa and they should put their eggs in the host nests, uh, but the hosts are uh, here al already, so if they have started, they they put their eggs too late, or there, there are no nests to put their eggs into. Would be a problem, obvious. Uh, pied flycatcher is known for uh, being uh, very dependent of moth larvae. And if they come late, the, we know that their success is poorer. Um, and also, like the black cap, and for all birds. Uh, if you come late, uh, it might happen that your territory is already occupied. So uh, we have seen that black caps wintering in northern Europe, they are more successful than the ones wintering further south. So they have sort of overtaken. And they are also, black caps are now more successful than the garden warbler, which is a sister species. So if early arrival is to prefer, so why not always arrive early? And uh, as you can see, this is uh, pink-footed geese in Trendlag arriving early, and it could be a quite harsh experience. Uh, the spring varies a lot in, north, in the north, so it's a very big challenge. We have seen at Lista, for instance, that uh, one year the lapwings came in early March, and then it went cold, and then the ground froze, and there was nothing to feed on, and they couldn't go back because they already used their energy, so they just froze to death. A large part of the population. Woodcock is doing the same. So, uh, and you don't have to be like this, this uh, variable spring, you don't have to go very far to see that this is a problem. Uh, you can see here, uh, this is Dokka temperatures this spring. It was very hot, late February. So skylarks coming in then would have a big problem soon after. Lapwings coming in the middle end of March using this uh, go with the flow <laughs> would have new problems. And, and this, like this, it goes all spring. Even for the African migrants that come early May, it goes down to like three, four degrees, which is very hard for a swallow. So what do we know? Um, there has been done a meta uh, investigation on uh, 21 European and Canadian bird observatories for 57 years. And it shows that, um, you can see here, that uh, this is earlier and the figure is going down like most of the other figures I'm, I'm going to show. So uh, within these 50 years from all these observatories, uh, the birds are coming approximately one week earlier. The other thing um, yeah, found out is that um, this is earlier. This dark thing is uh, short distance migrants and the gray one is long distance migrants. And we can see from the median of the population, uh, 
that uh, both in Canada and in Europe, uh, the long distance migrants are coming as well as early as the short distance migrants for the medium population. So the question I asked, are they able to change? Yes, as well as good as the, the short distance migrants. So uh, from this investigation, we made enough uh, the Norwegian Ontology Society a phen phenology index for the spring. Uh, for these two bird observatories, 30 species in different groups and cat categories, which shows that yeah, probably a bit hard to see, but it goes up and down, up to four days later than average and down to five days earlier than average for the, the average of 30 species. But what we can see here, it's the regression line is going down and now, after 32 years, including 2021, the birds are coming 3.1 days earlier. But even with this, there is large variation. And last year was the third latest of all these years, because it was a cold spring. Uh, we also looked at uh, temperatures uh, and arrival not only the, the time, uh, but temperatures. And we can see that uh, with raising temperatures, it also falls. And uh, um, for one degree milder uh, average of uh, April and May at Lista, uh, the birds are coming 1.3 days earlier. So, so uh, the actual year's climate is very important. Um, so, uh, finally, we can look at the bio-wet species. Uh, I've picked five species that we have like good numbers. Um, and uh, I've added some four extra species that have some rather good numbers. Or the numbers could be as well as good, but the method is a bit, uh, yeah. So we can see that uh, the gray leg goose comes uh, 15 days earlier, while the Dunlin doesn't come any earlier at all. This is like the big difference. Uh, this is at Lista Jomfrulan, and we're talking about the median date. The thing, when most people are talking about arrival, they are looking at the first bird. We look at the whole population, and when everyone is counted, then we can measure when was the... We have to have reasonable numbers. Uh, it has to be only one population. If not, they will uh, yeah, affect each other. And uh, we should pick non-breeding species to avoid uh, multiple counts. Uh, so uh, first out, here is the gray leg goose uh, coming 14 days earlier in spring but actually leaving 18 days earlier in autumn. So it uses the time uh, coming earlier to be able to go back earlier. So it, this is the Western Norwegian population that goes all the way to Spain. Uh, so it's uh, good for them to come back, <laughs> seems. Um, yeah, it goes, with the, when these regression line go down, they are coming earlier. If it goes up, they are coming later. The widgeon uh, have the same pattern in spring, uh, not that much as the gray leg geese. Uh, and it's non-significant because it goes up and down a lot. Uh, but opposite to the gray leg geese, they are coming, they are staying longer. So they use the different climate to widen their season in Norway. A good choice. <laughs> Mm. Uh, then again, the teal, that looks quite uh, the same as the widgeon in a way, the same kind of species, uh, comes earlier in spring uh, and goes earlier in autumn. So it doesn't do the same as the, the, the widgeon, actually. Curlew doesn't, uh, comes three days earlier in, in spring, but in autumn, 1.4 days is, yeah almost nothing. 
And then we have the Dunlin. That doesn't come earlier in spring at all. It goes all the way up to the Arctic. Uh, but it seems, not only seem, it's coming quite much earlier back. So it might happen that when they go to the Arctic, uh, it's already clear, it's warm, they can do, do it quick and get back. And then they don't want to stay there. They want to come go to Africa and find the winter territories as early as possible. Uh, Pink-footed goose, no less than 40 days in 30 years. It's very extreme. Uh, it's a nice, smooth curve here. Uh, you had some data from here that was actually much less. Uh, so they used to go mid-May uh, 30, 40 years ago, and now they're actually predicted to come about 31st of March. This is quite good data. The problem, why it isn't included, is actually now coming before we start the counting period. <laughs> so we have to change. Uh, and they also seem to don't rush that much back, so they're even coming later back. Then we have two passerines going all the long-distance migrants. Barn swallow coming also earlier in spring, uh, approximately four days, which is an average number. And they are staying probably a bit longer in autumn. Could be they can have two clutches, so, so it's a possibility to stay longer. House Martin, much the same. Little less in both directions. And then finally, the ring plover uh, coming the same three, four days earlier, but then leaving also earlier. See a uh, large fluctuations here, so it's not specific, non specific. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> my tongue. Yeah, you know what I meant. <laughs> so we have uh, the sum up here. Um, in uh, spring arrival, there are two species, the geese that comes very much earlier. The other ones is like from zero to six days earlier. Uh, in autumn, it goes in both directions. It's an opportunity to stay longer when the climate is better, uh, or you can use the quick breeding to go south again. So uh, we see a large variation in change of arrival time. There are different adaptation strategies, clearly. Some leave earlier, others stay longer. Species need to be treated individually. You can't just talk about the birds are coming earlier and going. You have to look at each species, even, even po possibly the pos population of a species. Uh, this makes, we, when counting, we only find out what is happening. So for the BUVET, there is a lot of potential to look in certain species and try to find out why is this staying longer? Why is this not staying longer? And yeah. Thank you. Good. We have come to the final session now. Can, can I have a question? Yes, please. Sorry. Um, because it's uh, a thing that interests me a lot, and I studied this in Evo, and uh, uh, not with uh, the data is there, there is no so much graphics. Uh, no, some uh, analysis, statistical analysis of the data. But for example, the gray lag goose, I think they, they stay less time in winters. So to compensate the biggest time that uh, they stay in here. Uh, they arrive normally in the beginning of October. In the last uh, seven years, I don't uh, notice some difference. But the, 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 the departure data, uh, date, that they go again to the north is more early. The, normally they uh, go to the north uh, 10 of February, 11, 15, and now they start to go to north 28 or 29 of January. The swallows, uh, uh, they start, is a difference, like you said, each species have uh, a pattern, but the swallows start to stay there. I think uh, I have a lot of swallows in the winter, 40 swallows in January, in December, they start. And I think with the times, the species that don't uh, really need to migrate because 
the temperature is rising and there is food, they gonna stay to the breeding and don't migrate. I think the, the goal is that to some species and the other is uh, what do you think is the typically the, the the black cap there is so it it could change but like uh, with the barn swallow for instance our barn swallows they they do this leapfrog migration so when it's occupied in portugal they have to go further and further so so when we yeah they go all the way to to pretoria with with, with banding we can see that they go so 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 it's important to, to know which population you are talking about in a way. There are many populations and they can, they can uh, adapt to different situations. Yeah, yeah. If you are close, uh, if you have a very long programming to, to go, you would follow that. Uh, the black caps in, in Europe, they have a quite broad and then they, then they can change with some generations. Yeah, this, so, I understand that with the swallows. I think the year pass, more swallows I saw in the winter because the young ones, um, the young ones stays uh, more time and even all the time in the, in yeah. the time of winter. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. We have just begun. Kitty Sally, are you here? Could you enter the stage, please? Yes, he will be also here. He will, we will be together. Connor, are you here? You, you. Ah, there you are. Lovely. Thank you. How was the day for you, Connor? Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> just got it. Just hold it on this one. We don't have sound yet. Just a second. Could you check your microphone, please? Is it muted? Uh, yeah, okay. It's oh. now. <laughs> we did it. Please. Hello. Kitty, are you waiting for me to talk or are you going yes. to talk? Yes, I'm waiting for you. Oh, right. Okay. Well, um, so the looking at, at what's next for BioWet, um, as Chris Whitehead mentioned in our, the video from Martin Meir, this was an Erasmus Plus program and the UK is no longer in Erasmus Plus. Um, and that is difficult. Uh, so that essentially in terms of that aspect of it, of young people traveling, there isn't something in place for that to happen Uh with the current setup. So that's something that we would need to change. However, we set up the website. We have the, a web page on the Welly website with BioWet data. And when people send it to me, I upload data to that page and that will absolutely continue. That's absolutely fine. Very happy doing that. Um, perhaps, you know, perhaps after this large seminar, there'll be more excitement and, and someone will approach the group and say, you know, I'll, I'll build you a dedicated website. And if so, I mean, that's that's even better. That's more time and more effort that can be dedicated to it. But in terms of presenting BioWet, uh, making that website available, keeping the data sharing, absolutely 100% there for you. Perhaps you can find us an Irish wetland, Connor. <laughs> they can participate. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, there's there's plenty yeah. yeah yeah so there are possibilities definitely yeah. definitely yeah just you know just because the uk won't be involved you know it's a flyway there's loads of other countries yeah. please keep going yeah thank you then i will wrap this meeting up because we are um shortly going on a boat trip to get the dinner served uh, in the Ransfjorden. And I hope as many as possible can join us. And uh, the ferry will start here at uh, Saga and it will end at Lingstern Camping. And if somebody has got a car here, we will 
uh, make a contribution to get people down here, but that will not be before seven o'clock. So uh, you just need to be aware of the timetable because the boat doesn't stop. It's, um, it's a slow boat, slow boat for dinner. Um, for the future uh, with BioVet, we, we want to continue this. We think that um, the last couple of um, information we got this afternoon is quite serious. Uh, and we know we're in a, we are in a hurry. So we want to do more and a little bit faster. So, but we want to continue the local work here because we have we have a perfect surrounding to do local field work and we have the perfect companies to work with. We have the Ransfjord Museum and we have Docker Delta Wetland Center. And we have also, this is persons you know, this one and that one is very proud of his boat. Nobody else can drive that boat. It's just Alice's boat. <laughs> so when we are going out in the wetland, we just have to use that one. And um, usually we get a permission to do so a little bit earlier than else. And we want to continue with these guys. They contribute enormously to the engagement of the young people we have at school. We can get go out, we can do outdoor uh, field activities, we can put our hands in and our feet in, and we, we give the young people a much more um, valuable uh, education. We can't do this inside the classroom, it's not possible. And we have some old guys, they were invited here today, but they didn't come when we are going fishing. They are experts at the fishing in the fjord and all about fish. And many young people here at Dokka, they haven't been fishing. They live here and they haven't been fishing. They haven't been out in the boat. So we think we, we are doing quite a good job. Uh, every year we get about 130 pupils out in the Dokka Delta, and it's a three or four day period. And, uh, and all the employees at the Ransfjord Museum and Dokka Delta are exhausted when we are ready, but we do it again next year. So we are extremely grateful. Uh, and about <laughs> authorization, um, perhaps if we will continue with this and we will do some more work in the Delta, we think it will be easier if the Docker Delta Wetland Center is authorized. So they have a little bit more time to us. They are working very hard and have many, many projects. And, um, we have to make them find some time when they are going to do some work for us in the school. And uh, the Minister of Climate and uh, Environment, he was talking to us today, but he, they have written something about authorized wetlands and all the things that you can read there, it's, it's what we do here. So we, we, uh, we are um, online, I think. And um, at last, I want, can you come up here? Um, Finauden and me made an invitation list for this seminar. And we wrote to many people, many powerful people, and some of you are sitting here today, but this one was very special. Um, can you say a little bit what yes. you did? We wrote a letter to Sir David Attenborough and asked him to mm. maybe he, he could send us a little uh, greeting. And he did. <laughs> On a paper, it, by the mail, and it was sent to school. Yep. And you received it. And uh, I have lost my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. Dear Finn Grundal and Kitty Sale. Thank you for your letter. I hope you will forgive me for, do not, uh, for not doing as you requested. You are sincerely David Attenborough. He's 95 years old, so we do forgive him. <laughs> uh, we thought that was very sweet. And now Finauden and me are going to fight about having that one on the wall. <laughs> you will have it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>